Let's talk about, of course, mm -hmm. UFC 160. Yeah. Bigfoot Silva. Mm -hmm. Not more than a year ago, mm -hmm. you absolutely mauled this guy, yeah. and yet here he is in the rematch. Yeah, I think you know him, him, him proving himself. You know he, he he has done that. He uh, he's done a two-fight winning streak. He just knocked out Asa Overeem. Um, a huge victory. A huge victory. Yeah, you know, knocking him out. Where it's a thing where you know you can't underestimate anybody in the sport because you know it's uh, everything's so close. You know, so so easily to uh, to win a fight. You know, with uh, with with it being the little gloves and everything else like that. What new tools do you think he will bring into the octagon at UFC 160, mm -hmm. and how will his game plan change? I think the, the most important thing for us is to just try to be quicker than him. Um, he's, he's, he's really fast. If you just stand right in front of him, you know, he has strong punches from there. So I think being faster than him, moving in and out, would kind of be the key for that. In your first fight with Bigfoot, uh, what I found to be very, very interesting is, man, it looked like a horror movie out there. Yeah. When you cut him mm -hmm. up and busted him up, blood was gushing everywhere. I know that was a first for you. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of take us into the octagon yeah. there and tell us what is that like? When you see that much blood, are, are you grossed out by it? You know, for me, um, it really makes no difference. You know, um, it's all, I'm just focused on, on, on the task at hand. I mean, it all depends on, on the person you are, I guess, you know, if you get grossed out with that kind of thing. I mean, you know, being in there, though, you know, the, the smell of the octagon, the smell of the blood and everything else kind of hits you. But Describe that. You know, you, you get that, that iron smell and, you know, you, you know that, that your opponent's bleeding really bad. And, you know, um, but you're just really thinking about just the win, you know, um, try to get this fight done as fast as possible and, you know, just win. So There's that term, right, the, the shark. Yeah, uh, smells the blood in the water. Yeah, yeah. Does that does that really happen when you get in there? When you see that blood, and especially the way Antonio Silva mm -hmm. was pricked open and, and just gushing. Yeah. I mean, does that I guess get you motivated? You know, it's not just blood. It's it's it's, it's, it's if you see your your opponent hurt. You know, if you see if you, if you uh, throw a good shot, you see him wobbling or, or something like that. I mean, you you kind of just feed off of that. You know, this is your chance to to go in and, and possibly finish the fight. Mm -hmm. Let me talk to you about. Um, when you reclaim the, the heavyweight belt, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but leading up to that fight with JDS, it just kind of seemed like you had this angry chip on your shoulder. Yeah. Every single time I saw you get in a fight, every single time I saw you do an interview, <laughs> you kind of had this angry look in your eye. Am I right in saying that? I, I kind of had to be, you know? And in the first fight, I didn't have that, that fire, you know, with the, with the injury and everything else, you know, it just wasn't there, you know? But now that I, that I knew that my body was 100%, going into that fight, I knew that I was, you know, I had to be focused and just the task at hand, so. I think there's this misconception, right, that wrestlers have to be boring, especially mm -hmm. after this GSP and Nick Diaz fight. Man, a lot of the fans were not pleased yeah. uh, by the effort put out by George St. Pierre, despite the fact it being an incredibly dominating performance. Mm -hmm. You're not that guy. Yeah. I mean, you're an amazing wrestler, and yet you have pretty much finished or hurt every mm -hmm. single guy that you have faced. Mm -hmm. What makes you different than your prototypical grappler in the UFC? I think me, my style of, uh, of fighting is, you know, if, if we are looking for a takedown and, and we do get it, we're, we're down there, I'm always looking to strike, to score points, you know, to strike, to, uh, I mean, you know, submissions there, definitely take it, but my, my preference basically is to, uh, is to strike when I'm down there. So I think that, that definitely does make it exciting. So anytime um, my style is just control, strike, we, we end up moving, you know, control again, strike. So always looking for a good time to, to do that. I know it's not an official policy by the UFC, but the UFC is obviously, when they cut John Fitch, I think they made a statement uh -huh. saying, if you're not exciting and you're not winning, mm -hmm. you're not going to be in the organization. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this de facto policy in the UFC? Uh, for me, you know, it's, it's kind of hard, you know, to uh, see guys get cut. I mean, with, with John, I think he, he is exciting for his style of fighting because, I know the wrestling, you know, I, I know all the jujitsu and all the stuff that he does out there definitely does excite me because I, I, I know a lot of it, you know. I think a lot of the, the, the fans out there definitely want to see more, you know, striking on their feet, on the ground as well, you know, but um, definitely, you know, in the sport, it's, it's a well-rounded sport, you need to be a fan of, of, of everything, you know. I don't think anyone's mistaking you for being a boring fighter, mm -hmm. despite the fact, again, that you're an awesome grappler. Mm -hmm. 
right? So, I mean, what, I guess what advice would you kind of give, and, and what would you like to see as a fan of the sport and as a competitor, mm -hmm. what would you like to see from your fellow competitors in the octagon in terms of being able to grapple and strike? Yeah, just for, um, you know, for them, I'm, I'm not really sure. Just, just my style is I'm always looking to strike, and that's, it's, it's what I love, you know? This is why I got into the sport, because for me, wrestling wasn't enough, you know, at that moment. I needed it to pretty much, you know, just... Put a hurting on somebody. Hit somebody, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so, yeah. Okay, I got you. Do you think it's fair? And do you think, do you think that it can have some long-term impacts, this de facto policy of cutting, um, I guess, boring and losing fighters, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, do you think it can have a long-term impact on the sport, mm -hmm. changing the way people fight, changing game plans? Do you think that can happen? Probably could, you know? I mean, people are going to have this in the back of their heads that, hey, if I, if I go out there and I'm, and I'm not excited, or if I go out there and I lose, you know, I'll, I'll probably end up getting cut. Mm -hmm. So either that will, you know, be a good thing where people will go out and, you know, do more exciting stuff and, you know, um, just kind of mo motivate them to win or they might be, you know, gun shy because, hey, you know, this, this, is, this is always, you know, in the back of my head, so. Is it good for mixed martial arts? I mean, to get the strongest roster that they can, I mean, is, is what they're trying to do. Strongest you know? and most exciting. I think, yeah, I think that, that, that that's what they're trying to do. It sounds like good for business, but some fighters I've talked to might say it's not necessarily good for the sport. Would you, yeah. would you agree with that? Um, I think, you know, the UFC has done a great job of, uh, you know, trying to bring in their top guys and keep them in there. You know, I think, you know, definitely, you know, some, you know, some people that, that, that they have cut, you know, I don't like, but I mean, hopefully, you know, they can go on um, some other or mm -hmm. organization, you know, win a couple of fights, come back and then, you know, be strong as ever. This is a scenario I don't know if too many people have brought up before, but mm -hmm. you're a relatively small heavyweight. Mm -hmm. uh, you walk around, you said at uh, 250. Mm -hmm. uh, John Jones, relatively large, light heavyweight. Mm -hmm. Is there a scenario where you can see you and John mixing it up at, let's say, a catch weight? Um, with, I'm just going to throw a number out there. Would 220 work? Yeah, I think so. You know, if, uh, if, if it all came down to it where there really wasn't anybody else for, for, for me to fight in my, in my division, you know, and, and him in his division. But I think um, also with Daniel Cormier going in, you know, in, into his uh, weight class will definitely pay a fa you know, play a factor because I think uh, Daniel Cormier can beat him. You say... If there's no one else to fight in the heavyweight division, to me what that tells me is that you're looking to clean out the division first. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking about the super fight first and then cleaning out the division. No. You'd like to clean out the division first. For me right now, it's just ho holding the belt, you know. Um, that's it. So whoever they put in front of me, um, you know, the, my goal right now is to go out there and to perform, win, and, you know, Hold that belt. So there you go. All right. So speaking of John Jones, his next opponent is Chael Sonnen. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a guy who has never uh, used trash talk yeah. to, to get to where you're going to get to. You've just gone in there, competed, fought, and, mm -hmm. and did your thing. Uh, and you are the champion. Mm -hmm. you, you set a great example for all mixed martial arts fighters and, and a lot of the fans as well. But Chael Sonnen, <laughs> I love the guy. Yeah. Crazy as a dingbat. But the guy's used trash talk to get himself into title contention mm -hmm. at middleweight and now at light heavyweight. Yeah. What do you think about fighters using that tactic? You know, if it works for them, I mean, why not? You know, he, he's definitely gotten great opportunities for, you know, for using that. I think, I think he, he uh, used it in a, in a good way. I mean, for, for me, you know, and for fans, I think, I think it's funny, you know, the way he talks trash and, and everything else. I mean, so, um, you know, if it, it's, it's working for him, definitely. Okay. Um, I know you've told the story a million times over, but mm -hmm. uh, we've got a lot of Spanish-speaking folks here uh, in Los Angeles, and, and you, of course, are the very first Mexican-American uh, mixed martial art heavyweight mixed martial arts champion or mm -hmm. boxing champion, for mm -hmm. that matter. Um, uh, tell us about the story of your father. Yeah, my my dad uh, grew up in Mexico, and when he was around 18 or so, he he wanted to come over to the U.S. So, you know, the, um, he he crossed the border illegally to, work, to, to get work here in the U.S. and then, you know, send money back to his, to his mom and, and, all, that, and all, all, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, in, in the process of getting deported and, and stuff like that. So, oh, he's been deported as well? Yeah, yeah. So with all that, you know, it's just uh, a thing that it, it definitely hits, hits close to home. You know what I mean? And uh, just, just proud of, of what, what he's done in his life, you know, uh, to, to provide for us as a, 
as a family and stuff like that. So I mean, I'm just I'm just happy for that. You've definitely worn that mantle proudly and well. You you have the brown pride written across your chest, mm -hmm. and you always come into that fight with that Mexican flag wrapped around your your, your glove. Why is that so important to you, and, and how much of an impact do you think that is having on the Latino community? For me, a lot of it's tradition, you know. Um, I feel like, you know, my, my parents are, are, are from Mexico, um, that, that me representing, you know, what, where I come from is, is just a, a thing for me, and uh, I think it carries on tradition, you know, with having the, the Mexican music, you know, that, that I have. Um, in the in the song, it's kind of talking about the same thing about getting deported and crossing the border and all those kind of things. So it kind of hits close to home where, you know, my dad has done the same thing. So it's kind of a tribute song for him.